Welcome back to Realism Overhaul. Today we've got one last sounding rocket to do. Uh, this one's sort of a strange design underneath the fairing. Um, I was doing a few sounding rocket contracts, and some of them had quite a lot of sounding payload. So you see the three metal cylinders here just full of these, uh, I think it was 500 some or maybe 400 some sounding payload to get a downrange. Funny enough, the final stage didn't even light, but I was able to get far enough downrange um, to make this work. And this is hopefully going to be the very last sounding rocket contract that we will ever, ever have to do. There's one more uh, suborbital sort of rocket later in the series, but it's not fulfilling any contract at all. So what happened next is crude flight into space, and yep, as you can see, I pretty much made a glider and strapped it to the side of a rocket because I couldn't think of anything more Kerbal than that. Yeah, I could have just sort of made a capsule or did what I did in the 131 series where um, I used a design from a, I, th I think it was Lucy's design, um, of putting a uh, cockpit inside of the fairing and then launching that up so the fairing would take the aerodynamic heat for re-entry and then it would let go, but eh, I want to do something a little bit different. Um, these suborbital hops aren't going to last too long and I think I only launched four of these. And actually, these were very, very profitable and surprisingly stable except for towards the end of the burn time of this rocket, it lost aerodynamics and sort of pitched down a little bit that you can see there. And then it just jettisons the rocket away from it and orients itself to go straight back down into the atmosphere and luckily it doesn't burn up for some reason. I guarantee if we tried to make this go higher and higher that it wouldn't re-enter but luckily just above the atmosphere it was able to re-enter perfectly fine. And this this did uh, complete several suborbital contracts, again was surprisingly profitable not really sure how, but there were multiple uh, suborbital contracts that I was able to complete. I think got a few hundred thousand, I think a few hundred thousand funds for it. Um, I only was able to send up Jebediah and Valentina. The I did not go through the RP1, I th think they're programs, no courses, uh, for the X1 cockpit for the scientist and engineer. Because, to be honest, it didn't really matter that much to get all of them flight ready for this mission. Flying this mission only pushes back their retirement rate like maybe a month at most. And because I wasn't really planning on using these uh, these gliders for very long, it's not really going to uh, help my crew not retire. So I guarantee, actually no, I, I can fully guarantee the crew has all retired by now. By the end of this episode, we no longer have any astronauts, unfortunately. But they were able to put these flights under their belt. Um, and landing these things was the most difficult part of the process, because touching down at anything above 100 meters per second was, well, it proved deadly in simulations. And stall speed was about 50 meters per second, and it was really delicate balance of landing in between those, and even if you did, somehow, sometimes, it's not stable. This landing here was the most stable landing of all of these glider launches, which I actually did not come up with a name for. I think I just called them suborbital gliders. So these missions were the first instance in which Kerbals got to see Earth from space uh, when the cockpit uh, turned around 180 degrees to fall straight back down to the atmosphere. It is an unprecedented view, unprecedented, I think that's the word, view of the KSC and of Earth, and quite beautiful. In the previous episode, I had mentioned the fact that I had built a sounding rocket that had enough delta V to reach orbit. And although this is true, if I had built it at the time next in line, instead of doing these crude flights, it would have been sort of a bankruptcy or success type deal, kind of like a Munner bust type, very Kerbal situation. Um, 
but that was before I realized I have crude suborbital flights available, and I have X-plane contracts available, and I can do all of these by strapping a glider to a rocket. So that's exactly what I did. Now, the purpose of this episode is not to display uh, some crude suborbital flights and the final sounding rocket contract. No, these are just stepping stones onto the major contract I intended on completing this episode, which is the first orbital satellite contract. And for this, I had mentioned before, I had a sounding rocket with enough delta V to reach orbit uh, called Sounding Foxtrot, uh, but it is scrapped, so I didn't really like the design. And what I ended up doing was designing a sort of R7 derived rocket. It, it's not a full replica of the R7, but it definitely uh, is inspired by it. And I used one of the Sputnik satellite probes. So it was a, it's a pretty, pretty close looking recreation of the Sputnik launch and the Sputnik satellite. However, it's got, it's got a few differences, um, and one of those being its name, which I called Loner Satellite. It is pretty much going to do the same thing that Sputnik did, launch up into orbit, and just beep until it dies, basically. Uh, this is one of the scarier launches here, where for some reason we had a lisp to the left, and I'm not really sure why, but it, I really struggled with keeping the wings off the ground um, and not breaking the aircraft. So luckily, that was a success as well. This one is an example. I went a little bit too far from shore and wasn't able to glide back to the runway and had a ditch in the water. And interestingly enough, I actually ran into a problem where it took about 10 minutes for it to stop in the water. It got to about two meters per second and then didn't slow down. It kept speeding up up to like two or three back to two for about 10 minutes and just wouldn't stop moving. So I couldn't recover the vessel. And it took me eventually making all of the control surfaces flaps set down and yawing to the side, whichever side works, a little RCS until it almost went dry, until it finally stopped moving and I was able to recover it. It was a little bit of a weird bug. Um, and lastly, the fourth launch of this I was unsuccessful in the landing. Everyone survived, but this marked the final glider to suborbital flight. It was just too dangerous. So what we ended up doing was taking a V2 rocket and strapping a camera on it. And so Kerbals could not have to be in that cockpit to see the view from space. Now it is an old black and white camera. Um, but what happened is the camera is in the midsection of this V2 launch it up so orbital a panel shoots out and revealing the camera which gets a nice video footage of re-entry now this v2 rocket didn't complete any contracts but it did give me a little bit of science in the form of the planetary observation camera i believe is the science part that i put on here which only took a minute with Kerbalism, so I was able to run that um, in space low above water. And this is the video footage of the V2 returning back to Kerbin. Not Kerbin, this is the Earth. Back to Earth and splash down. And immediately afterwards, this did take two years to build. Almost the entire time of the first satellite contract took two years to build. Um, two months to roll out because of the, the VAB settings I have right now, the upgrades. But it is here on the launch pad, and unfortunately, these engines are not very reliable. If I was able to do full reliability, as well, maximum reliability on all of these engines on here, which is 4, 8, 16, 19 engines on the first stage. Um, I would not have been able to complete this. It would have taken far longer than two years. It would have taken about five or six years. It's taken many more months to roll out, and that would not have been able to complete the contract anyway. So what we had to do is we had to chance it. So the loner satellite is away. Exploring space has captured the imagination of people everywhere. 
Today, it's not at all unusual to find many of these people, busy as ever with the everyday problems of living, thinking and wondering about space. What is to be found out there? Asking themselves if life exists on any of the planets. For how long will it be before man can travel to these distant celestial bodies? Imaginative men have been asking these same questions for centuries. But today there's nothing idle or fanciful about their curiosity. Not when our modern science and technology have already made it possible much more. equipment to send this information back to Earth. The special value of the satellite is that once it reaches a position in space where there is a balance 